Lux presents Hollywood. Lieber Brothers Company, the makers of Lux Flakes, bring you the Lux Radio Theater, starring Charles Boyer and Madeline Carroll in The Ghost and Mrs. Muir. Ladies and gentlemen, your producer, Mr. William Keeley. Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. In the December Reader's Digest, you may have been interested to read, as I was, of the current revival of ghosts in England. Unlike most Americans, the English tend not only to believe in ghosts, but to cherish them as an indispensable part of British life. Tonight, we ourselves present a very fascinating spirit in 20th Century Fox's screen success, The Ghost and Mrs. Muir. Our stars in this unusual romantic drama are Charles Boyer and lovely Madeline Carroll. Madeline making her first Hollywood appearance since her distinguished record overseas. While people say that seeing is believing, I'm not quite sure that that applies to ghosts. Truly, you uh, generally can't see them, but you can often trace the results they have on people's lives, as in our play tonight. In the same way, you can't see the qualities in Lux Flakes, but you can certainly see the results, both in the way Lux keeps those precious fabrics looking lovely longer, and also the way it brightens the lives of busy housewives everywhere. On to the first act of The Ghost and Mrs. Muir, starring Charles Boyer as Captain Gregg and Madeline Carroll as Lucy Muir. <laughs> Some 50 years ago in London, a young and handsome widow, Lucy Muir, left the home of the mother and sister of her departed husband and boarded a train. With her went her small daughter, Anna, and a servant named Martha. There, the little one's asleep now, Mum. Maybe now you can tell me where we're going. You've been very patient with me, Martha. I suppose we are running away. I can't say I blame you, Mum. Nagging at you morning till night, telling you what you could do and what you couldn't do. <gasps> Sinful it was, Mum. That will be enough, Martha. Yes, Mum. We're going to a village called Whitecliff. Whitecliff by the sea. You've taken a house there, Mum? I've been in touch with a leasing agent, a Mr. Coombs. He has several houses for rent. There must be one we can afford. At least we'll be by ourselves. Well, good for you, Mum. Good for you. We should be there soon. We'll stay at the inn till Mr. Coombs finds the house we want. Yes, ma'am. Oh, Martha, I know I'm doing right. I know. I still say, Mrs. Muir, that you'll find no better home in Whitecliff than Laburnum Mount. It's newly built, it's near the village, but and it's... But I can't understand why you won't show me Gull Cottage. The description in your file is most intriguing. Oh, believe me, madam, Gull Cottage wouldn't suit you at all. I suppose there's something wrong with it. Is it the drains? Well, I put up a house for rent, Mrs. Muir. You may be sure there's nothing wrong with the drains. Then why shouldn't it suit me? Oh, will you kindly allow me to be the judge of that? Now about but this... But if I'm going to live in the house, I should be the judge, Mr. Coombs. I'm sure there's another agency in Whitecliff. Perhaps they have Gull Cottage listed also. Very well, Mrs. Muir. Come, I'll show you Gull Cottage. Well, you wanted to see Gull Cottage, and I've shown you Gull Cottage. Now we can leave but it's and... lovely, and so close to the ocean. And so far from a neighbour. I can't understand it. Why should a house like this remain empty? Well, it's been without a tenant for four years. Of course, it's terribly dusty, but... <gasps> Mrs. Muir! Who, who's that in there? There in... Oh, it's a portrait. A portrait on the wall. Oh, oh, that. Uh, <laughs> yes, the former owner, uh, Captain Gregg. The room's so dark for a moment I thought it was someone real. Well, a sea captain... That explains the scheme of decoration, doesn't it? Which is all in frightful taste. Oh, it's a delightful room. Mrs. Muir, I assure you this house will not suit you at all. Nevertheless, I shall go upstairs. But, but, but there are only three rooms upstairs. They're all bedrooms. The main bedroom, oh, it's quite ugly. It's drafty. It's full of... 
Oh, well, see for yourself then. Why, it's charming. And a balcony, a balcony overlooking the sea. But what's this? A telescope. Captain Greg, madam, he liked to watch the passing ships. As I shall too, Mr. Coombs. I suppose you have a reason for disliking this place so intensely, but I could become very fond of it. <laughs> so, <laughs> Mr. Coombs. Maybe now you know my reason. Well, you would come. I didn't want to show it to you, but oh no, you had to see it. Haunted. How perfectly fascinating. Well, eight times I've rented it and eight times the tenants have left after the very first night. Oh, what a pity, Mr. Coombs. That laughter, that was Captain Gray. It was indeed. But why does he haunt? Was he murdered? Well, he committed suicide. I wonder why. Mr. Coombs, I've decided to take Girl Cottage. You what? It's so ridiculous. Ghosts, apparitions. Madam, with your own ears. But you heard him yourself. The wind in the chimney, Mr. Coombs. Please arrange for us to move in tomorrow. What time is it, Mama? Way past sleepy time, Anna, darling. No more stories tonight. Now off to sleep with you. I love it here, Mama. Our own house and our own ocean. Even the rain sounds different than the rain in London. <laughs> That's because we are so close to the sea, darling. You're not afraid of the storm, are you? <laughs> Why should I be afraid? Of course. We are snug and warm in our own little harbor. Good night, darling. All tucked in, is she, Mum? She'll be asleep in two minutes. Me too, Mum. Oh, your hot water bottle's downstairs, Mum, on the kitchen table. And the kettle's on the stove. Thank you, Martha. <sighs> My, it's storming out there for fair, ain't it? I don't mind saying it's a bit scary, like... Martha. A strange house and all, and not a soul in a mile of us. Ooh. Oh, go to sleep, silly. I'll be up in a minute. <laughs> Strange. Why should Martha turn out the kitchen light? You've got it, Kendall. Light it. <gasps> what nonsense is this now? Now I'm hearing voices like Mr. Coombs. What's the matter with these matches? It's not the matches, it's... Very well, Captain Gregg. I know you're here. Are you afraid to speak up? Is that all you're good for, to, to, to frighten women? Well, I'm not afraid of you. Light the candle, light it. Well, how can I when you keep blowing out the matches? Light the blasted candle! Ah, that's better. Well? You, uh, you are Captain Gregg. Who the devil else would I be? I, I'm sorry I called you a coward. I, I didn't mean to embarrass you. Embarrass me? I mean, because of the way you died. What? The way I died, madam? Committing suicide. Who the devil said I committed suicide? Mr. Coombs said you Coombs did. is a fool. I went to sleep in front of that confounded gas heater in my bedroom. I'm a restless sleeper. I kicked the gas on with my foot. It was a stormy night, like this. So I shut my windows, as any sensible man would. Well, wouldn't you? Yes, yes, I suppose so. Ah, well, the coroner's jury said it was suicide because my blasted charwoman Testified I'd always slept with my windows open. How the devil should she know how I slept? Oh, I'm so glad. Ah, you have a strange sense of humor, madam. I mean, because you didn't commit suicide. But if you didn't, why do you haunt? Because I have plans for my house, which do not include a pack of strangers making themselves at home. I think it's very childish of you frightening people. Well, in your case, I'll admit I, I chartered the course with regret. You're not a bad-looking woman, you know, especially when you're asleep. So you were in my room this afternoon while I was napping. My room, madam. And I thought I dreamed it all. But I knew I'd close the window, and, and when I awoke, I found it open. I opened the window because I didn't want another accident with a blasted gas. I'm quite capable of taking care of myself. Good. And you will pack your gear and shove off tomorrow, preferably the first thing in the morning. I will not go. The house suits me perfectly. It's my house, madam. 
And I intend to turn it into a home for retired seamen. Then you should have said so in your will. I didn't leave a will. Why not? Because I did not expect to kick the blaster gas on with my blasted foot. I won't be shouted at. For one year I've been shouted at and ordered about, and, and I'm sick of it, do you hear? Blast, blast, blast! <laughs> Temper. Or, or laughed at, either. I won't leave this house, I won't. No, no, I believe that. Stop that blasted blubbering, madame, or... I love this house. No. I, I can't explain it. it. It was as if the house itself were welcoming me, asking me to rescue it from being so empty. You can't understand that, can you? All right, then I'm a silly woman, but that's the way I feel. So, you love the house. Well, I admit, that's a point. And you did not frighten like the others. That's a point, too. All right, you may stay here, madam, but uh, on trial. Oh, thank you, Captain Gray. No, no, keep your distance, woman. I'm sorry. You made me so happy. No I... intention of making you happy. I merely want to do what's best for the house. Then you'll go away and leave us alone? I will not go away. Why should I? Oh, because of my child. I don't want her frightened into fits. But I never frighten children into fits. But think of the bad language she'd learn. Oh, confound it, madam. My language is most controlled. Well, Anna is much too young to see ghosts. Oh, very well. I'll make a bargain with you. Leave my bedroom as it is, and I'll promise not to go in any other room in the house. Then your brat and your servant need never know anything about me. But uh, if you keep the best bedroom, where should I sleep? In the best bedroom. But... Oh, in heaven's name, madam. I am a spirit. I have no body. I haven't had one in four years. Is that clear? But I can see you. No, no, no. All you see is an illusion, like a blasted lantern slide. Well, it... It's not very convincing, but I, I suppose it's all right. Uh, I always was a fool for a helpless woman. I am not helpless. Oh, well, if you're so confoundedly competent, you'll notice that your kettle is about to boil over. Oh, so it is. Thank you. Uh, one thing more. There is a portrait of me in the living room. I want it removed to the bedroom. Must I? It's a very poor painting. It's my painting. I did not invite your criticism. Well, I only meant it doesn't do you justice. It's All right, it... all right. Tend to your hot water bottles. <laughs> what a sorry substitute for... Good night, Captain. Uh, good night, good night, Mrs. Young. <laughs> good afternoon. Well, it's about time you came upstairs. Been waiting for hours. Why I agree to see you only in this room? You'll talk to me like a gentleman, Captain Gregg, or I'll go straight downstairs. Who the devil said you could chop down my tree out there? I ordered it chopped down. But hang it on, madam. I, I planted that tree with my own two hands. Think how much prettier your garden will look with a rose bed. I detest roses. I hope the whole blasted bed dies of blight. Captain Gregg, if you insist on haunting me, you might at least be more agreeable about it. Why should I be agreeable? Well, as long as we're living together... I mean, uh, if we're to be thrown together so much, life's too short to be forever barking at each other. <laughs> Your life may be short, madam, but uh, I have an unlimited time at my disposal. Then say something pleasant for a change. Well, that's uh, a pretty dress you have on. <laughs> Thank you. Much better than smothering yourself in all that black crepe. I happen to have been wearing mourning for my husband. Whom you didn't love. How dare you say that? Because it's true. You're jealous because no one put on any mourning for you. <laughs> that shows how little you know about it. Some poor misguided female, no doubt. Five poor misguided females, to be exact. <laughs> I should think you'd be ashamed instead of boasting about it. Why? They misguided themselves. Never raised a finger to help. Hmm, that's not what I've heard about sailors. Seamen, confound it. Sailor. Sailor is a landlubber's word. Now, why did you marry him? Edwin? I, I don't really know. He seemed so romantic. Hmm, but it was different afterwards, hmm? Did he beat you? Oh, no. Uh. Poor Edward never really did anything. <laughs> he was an architect, but not a very good one, I'm afraid. He couldn't have designed a house like this. Who did design it? I did, of course. It reminds me of something. An old song or, or a poem. Magic casements opening on the foam of paler seas in fairylands forlorn. Strange to find a sea captain quoting Keats. Oh, life can go slow at sea. Plenty of time for reading in the off watches. How wonderful it must be. Reading lyric poetry up in the crow's nest. With a sheet ah. bellying in the wind. Sails, blasted old madam. A sheet is a line, a rope. 
Ropes, Count Billy. Well, I don't know anything about the sea except that it's romantic. That's what all landsmen think. Seamen know better. Then why do they go to sea? Oh, because they haven't got enough sense to stay home. Like those two women at the front door. What two women? Look out the window. <gasps> no. Huh? Who are they? My blasted in-laws. And Martha's sure to send them up here. Well, well, what do you want of me? Well, do something. Hide. Go away and decompose. Dematerialize, madam. But whatever it is, do it quickly. They're on the stairs. Oh, no fear. They can't hear or see me unless I choose that they should. Oh, then please don't choose. I'll get rid of them. Why don't you let me? You know, I've had considerable experience. No, you're not to do anything. Well, Lucy, talking to yourself. Oh, my poor Lucy. So pale, so fragile. Mother Muir, Eva, how nice of you to call. Martha said you were up here resting. Oh, how can you rest in such an ugly room? Lucy, poor, poor child. And what a hideous portrait on the wall. Uh, with a face like yours, madam, you'd be wise to shut up. <laughs> oh, no. Why on earth don't you take it down? Because uh, I like it, Eva. Liar. Well, of course, if you want a portrait of a strange man in your room, well, that's up to you. Oh, Lucy, we have such bad news. The gold chairs, your entire income. What about the gold chairs? They're worthless. The mine is closed down. No more dividends, Lucy. It was all in this morning's newspaper. Oh, so we've come to take you and Anna back home with us. Eva... Eva, you're sure of this? Of course. No, no, don't make a scene in front of these swabs. I don't intend to make a scene. Oh, of course you don't. You're my brave little girl. Please, Mother Muir. Make her stop that caterwauling, or by Judas, I will take a hand. You keep out of this. Lucy, how can you talk to me like that? Oh, blast. Eva, did you hear what she said? Yes, Mother, I heard. Now stop sniveling. But I didn't mean you. Then just whom did you mean? You're acting in a most peculiar fashion, Lucy. Obviously, this dreadful place has preyed on your mind. <laughs> Bats in your belfry. Pipe <laughs> down. What? I mean, I, I, I want to think. But why? With your income gone, you'll have to come home with us. Don't do it, Lucy. Do you want me to stay? Yes. Lucy, are you out of your mind? You really mean it? Of course I mean it. Lucy, Lucy. I'm sorry, Mother. It's very kind of you, but I'm going to stay. I'll manage somehow. So please be good enough to shove off. Shove off? <laughs> She's insane. I, I want nothing more to do with her. Well, you don't have to push me, Mother. I'm going. Eva, I'm not pushing you. Stop it, Mother, please. But I'm not touching you, oh, Eva. Let go. Oh, stop it. <laughs> Captain Greg. Captain Greg. I'm out on the balcony. Are you? Well, I've had just about all of this I'm going to stand. Stop talking in riddles. Two days ago, you shoved those poor women out of this house. <laughs> Squealing like a couple of pigs. That wasn't enough, was it? What do you mean by pushing Mr. Coombs down the stairs just now? I only hope that when I reach the afterlife, I'll have a little more dignity. Dignity? You call it dignified, throwing yourself at a herring-gutted swab like Coombs? I asked Mr. Coombs here because he's the logical man to help me find lodgers for the summer. So, lodgers? Oh. Oh, I made a mistake. Oh, forgive me, my dear. I thought you wanted to sign Coombs on for a husband. Mr. Coombs, that walrus? Well, it's my experience that women will do anything for money. And now you and your blasted experience have ruined everything. Why? I could not allow lodgers in any case. They're worse than passengers at sea. It's them or star. Not at all. I've solved your problem. Madam... You're going to write a book. Book? Don't be ridiculous. It's all I can do to write a postcard. But I can write a book, and you can put it down on paper for me. What sort of a book? The story of my life. Ride and Swash. Yes. Ride and Swash by, by Captain X. I don't think that's at all a nice title. It's not meant to be. It's meant to be sensational, like the subject. But it takes months to write a book. What are we to live on in the meantime? Well, you have a little jewelry. Pawn it. Oh, but I could Oh, blast your eyes, madam. Will you understand you're trying to claw off a leash or? You can't afford to be squeamish. I do understand, and, and, and don't swear at me. All right, then uh, be sensible. Now, since we're going to be collaborators, you may call me Daniel. That's very good of you. And I shall call you Lucia. My name is Lucy. No, no, it doesn't do you justice, my dear. Women and Lucy are always being imposed upon. But Lucia, ah, 
Now, there is a name for an Amazon, for a queen. I don't feel much like a queen. I feel frightened and confused. Martha and I could always get along, but it's my baby. It's Anna. Well, don't you trust me? Oh, I do, Daniel, when I'm talking to you. But when you're not here, I... Well, it's... It's asking a great deal to expect anyone to entrust our whole future to someone who isn't real. But I am real, Lucia. I'm here because you believe I'm here. Keep on believing. And I'll always be real to you. Yes, Daniel. Now, get into town and pawn your blaster jewelry. And don't come back without a typewriter. Ah, yes. Blood and Swash by Captain X. Two of The Ghost and Mrs. Muir will continue in a moment. Libby, have you any romantic tidbits for our audience tonight? Well, it's not a big name story, Mr. Kennedy, but a very unusual real wedding took place on the set of My Wild Irish Rose during the last week of shooting. Oh, who were the lucky people? Two of the dancers in this fabulous new musical of Warner Brothers. And just imagine, Andrea King was the matron of honor. She looked almost like a bride herself in hand-embroidered white batiste. It was one of the costumes she wears in the picture. And uh, the best man? Dennis Morgan. Well... Andrea's romantic leading man. In fact, the entire cast of My Wild Irish Rose came as guests. And they looked very colorful in their Celtic costumes. Did the bride wear something old, something new, something borrowed, something blue? Uh Uh-huh. And Andrea saw to the new. She gave us some gossamer sheer nylons with embroidered clocks of tiny seed pearls. You mean to wear? Why, certainly. Andrea told her just to lux them, and they'd wear beautifully. And I'm sure that's true because lux flakes are so gentle, even the sheerest nylons last twice as long. You're absolutely right, Libby. Those famous strain tests proved it. Runs came sooner when stockings were washed with strong soap or rubbed with cake soap. All kinds of stockings, nylons, silk, rayon, and cotton, lasted twice as long when they were washed with lux flakes. That's just like getting an extra pair of stockings every time you buy a pair. And remember, girls, Lux Care prolongs the wear of everyday stockings as well as super shears. So Lux them after every wearing. Lux stockings last twice as long. We return you now to William Keeley. Act Two of The Ghost and Mrs. Muir, starring Charles Boyer as Captain Gregg and Madeline Carroll as Lucy. Summer has come to Whitecliff by the sea, but there's no clamor of lodgers in Gull Cottage. Instead, week after week, the constant clatter of a typewriter, as the ghost of Captain Daniel Gregg dictates the vivid story of his life to Lucy Muir. Well, why have you stopped typing? You didn't finish the sentence. It's it's that awful word, Daniel. It's a perfectly good word. I think it's a horrible word. It means what it says, doesn't it? All too clearly. Oh, hang it all, Lucia. If you're going to be prudish, we'll never get the book finished. Now, where was I? Upstairs. Oh, yes, yes. Um, The customs of Marseille are different to any... From any. Oh, cares. This is not a blast literary epic. It is the unvarnished story of a seaman's life. It certainly is unvarnished. (laughs) All right, all right. Smear on some varnish then, but uh, leave the guts in it. I think there should be a chapter about your boyhood, your school days. Never went to school. I was educated by the vicar. Poor man, you must have had a dreadful time. Oh, (laughs) I suppose you were a model of all the virtues at 12. (laughs) Certainly I was, and Anna shall be the same. Anna is not fat, as you probably were. I wasn't fat, I was skinny. Still worse. Hair ribbons and a thousand freckles, probably. I notice you still have freckles. Very few, and I've been told they're quite becoming. Uh, Let me see. Uh, Yeah, that... Uh, oh, good heavens, the time. Oh, I get some sleep. We'll put in a full day tomorrow. Oh, Lucia, you're sure you've said nothing about my being here? I mean, Martha knows nothing. Your little girl? Of course mm. not. They know I'm busy writing a book, but that's all. You've been very thoughtful about keeping your promise not to... to disturb them. Madam, I'm a man of my word. And what words? <laughs> 
Daniel, what did your aunt do when you ran away to sea? Oh, thank heaven, probably, that there was no one around to fill her house with mongrel dogs and track mud on her carpets. Did she write to you? Every Sunday for seven years. I was at sea when she died. What are you thinking? How lonely she must have been with her silent, empty house and her clean carpets. Good night, Lucia. Oh, the devil with your dawdling, Lucia. But I'm so tired, Daniel. Oh, I sent a sort two and the book is all finished. I can't see straight or think straight. You don't have to think. Just write this down. To all who follow the hard and honorable profession of the sea, to the after guard, to masters, mates, and engineers, to able-bodied and ordinary seamen, to stokers, carpenters, sailmakers, and sea cooks, I dedicate this volume. The end. The end. Ah, well, tomorrow you take it to the publishers. Why did you write the book, Daniel? It wasn't merely to save the house for me. Partly that, and partly to help people understand those poor devils who go to sea for want of better sense. Well, now, about the publishers. You'll go to Tackett and Sproul in Gretsmith Street. Yes, Daniel. Now, be sure you see Sproul. <laughs> he once came in fourth in the yacht race, fancies himself a seafaring man. Daniel... I... Hmm? What's to become of us? You and me. Well, nothing's to become of me. <laughs> Everything's happened that can happen. Have you forgotten how many illusions? Such an earthy illusion. When we were writing the book, I was happy. But now, when I try to think of the future, it's... It's all dark and confused. Like that fog out there tonight. Oh, you've been working too hard cooped up in the house too long. But I love it here. Yes, but you should be out in the world, meeting people, seeing men. I have no desire to see men. Well, confound it, you should. You know, you're, you are a, a very attractive woman. You owe it to yourself. Yes, Daniel. Now, take the early train, Lucia. Take it and sprawl, Great Smith Street. <laughs> Impossible, madam. You can't see Mr. Sproul without an appointment. But I have a manuscript here, and I'm sure you... A cookbook, you... perhaps. Gardening. Another life of Byron. Oh, really, Mrs. Muir? Oh, well, I'll mail you a notice when Mr. Sproul can see you probably next month. Thank you. Surely you're not leaving, Mrs. Um, Mrs. Muir? I have no appointment. Then you shall have mine. But, Mr. Fair. Oh, it's all right, Albert. Just tell old Sproul I wouldn't wait. Well... Aren't you going to thank me? It's very good of you, but, but I'm afraid I can't accept. You're a very beautiful creature. I can do no less than insist that you take my appointment. Mr. Sproul, will see Mr. Fairley, Albert. Well, Mrs. Muir, are you going in, or shall I carry you in? Really? Really? I don't know how you got in here, young woman, but this much I do know. I will not allow you to take up my time, and I will not review your manuscript. Shut up and sit down, you blasted grampus. Oh, dear. Madam... Are you a would-be author or a would-be ventriloquist? I... I don't know what you're talking about, Mr. Sproul. I distinctly heard... And such a nice-looking woman, too. <laughs> Mr. Sproul, please. This book, it isn't what you think it is at all. It's... it's, uh, the unvarnished record of a sailor's... I mean, seaman's life. Seaman? Hey, what could you know about seaman? Oh, a great deal, believe me. Hmm. Unvarnished, you say? Shamefully so. Oh, dear me. Well, uh, well, perhaps I'll glance at it after all. Uh, sit down, young woman. Uh, sit down. Better take another walk, Mr. Fairley. She's still in there with Mr. Sproul. She must be starving. Oh, I fetched them a tray of lunch some time ago. Hmm. I'll wait, Albert. I'll wait. Well, well, Mrs. Muir... This is quite a book. Thank you. You're not going to pretend that you wrote it. No. No, no, it's a man's book. And what a man. Captain X. <laughs> I'd like very much to meet him. Oh, I'm afraid that's impossible. He, uh, he's away. Oh, a voyage, of course. Yes, a very long voyage. Oh, bless my soul, what a story. 
Uh, we shall publish it, of course, Mrs. Muir. You just leave everything to me and uh, be happy that you know such a man. There aren't many like him these days. You appreciate that. I think I do, Mr. Sproul. And thank you very much. <laughs> Got so stuffy upstairs, I thought I'd wait for you down here. Mr. Fairley. Quite an appointment you had, wasn't it? But it's pouring now, and you haven't an umbrella. I'm quite capable of finding a cab. Oh, now, please. I deserve a minute, don't I? Mm. Dear me, I certainly didn't bargain for this blasted rain. As you said, you could find a cab. Ruin your hat, though, wouldn't it? Now, if you ask me nicely. Please. Would you mind? Oh, you're <laughs> smiling. I'll be right back. But why, why shouldn't I ride to the station with you? Perhaps I, too, must catch a train. I don't believe it. Really, Mr. Fairley, the sheer... Brass. The word you're looking for is brass. <laughs> exactly. Still, in a way, I should be grateful to you. You see, Mr. Sproul has agreed to publish my book. Mm -hmm. He always had a weakness for feminine literature. Well, this book might surprise you. It's surprising enough to find a lady author infinitely more exciting than her heroine could possibly be. Mm -hmm. I assume you also write, Mr. Fairley? Uh, yes, uh, children's books. Forgive me, Mrs. Muir, but uh, I am Uncle Neddy. Uncle Neddy? Ridiculous, isn't it? Why, you're adored by half the children in the world. Oh, I loathe the little monsters. My little girl is not a monster. I shall make an exception, then. I look forward to meeting her, Mrs. Muir. Uh, your husband also. My husband is dead. Oh, I'm so sorry. Oh, what a liar I am. I'm not sorry at all. As a matter of fact, I'm... Uh, well, uh, uh, your book. Tell me about your book. <laughs> Uncle Nady. Ah, uh, by Godfrey, what a load of bilge. Daniel, so you've been eavesdropping. I thought he said he had to catch a train, too. I rather think he only wanted to ride to the station with me. The way you were smirking at you, like a cat at a fishmonger's. I found him rather charming. Rather charming. Now you're starting to talk like him. Well, how in blue blazes do you want me to talk? Ah, it's better. I think you're being extremely childish. You should have pushed him out of the cab. In another minute, I would have. Daniel, why, I believe you're jealous. Well, of course I'm not jealous. <laughs> Jealousy is a disease of the flesh. I haven't had any flesh for years. I've never known you to be more disagreeable. And today, of all days... Yes, Prowl's bought the book. Yes, and now I can buy the house just as we planned. I'm not so sure I want you to have the house after all. I wish you'd stop this sulking. You said yourself that I... that I should see men. Yes, I said men, not a perfumed pencil pusher. <laughs> anyway, I... I shall never see him again. Well, that's what you think. Where are you going? I'm disappearing. Always hated trains anyway. I'll see you later, madam. Martha! Martha, where's Anna? She's in the orchard with Uncle Neddy. But I didn't expect him till tea time. Every day this week he's called. I can't be rude to him, Martha. I can. Hm. He's out there painting a picture. How exciting. Whenever you're ready, we'll have tea in the garden. Yes, Mum. I like your little girl, Lucy. She's very wise. For instance, how did she ever guess I wanted to be alone with you? If you bribed her to go uh, away... Aren't I... you interested in what I was painting before? You're quite accomplished, aren't you? I should think being Uncle Neddy would satisfy anyone. No, I also paint. Uh, under the name of Renoir. <laughs> oh, you're such a fool, Miles. <laughs> you know, that's quite the nicest thing you've ever said to me. And what, if anything, do you do as Miles Fairley? Specifically... I behave quite idiotically towards a young lady that I fell in love with in a publisher's office. Miles, please. Lucy, am I being unforgivably offensive? It's just that I'm... Well, I, I, I don't quite know what to say. Then say nothing. Take a look at this canvas. Why? It's me. You've been painting me in my, in my bathing costume. Mm -hmm. Every morning I've watched you and Anna on the beach. Not too bad, is it? It's very flattering, really. Oh, Lucy, darling, it would take a thousand Renoirs to... Oh, Lucy. You shouldn't have done that. You shouldn't have kissed me. Well, that was unforgivable, wasn't it? But I shall not go away, even if you send me. 
And I shall see you again, even though you forbid it. I'm sure I, I have no control over where you go or what you do. Then you won't forbid it. Miles, please. If you do want to see me, go away now. Yes, Lucy. If you want it, my darling. Ah, no wonder you wanted to plant a rose garden here. Daniel. Perfect setting to be kissed in. Oh, you've been spying on me again. No, merely happened to be haunting the vicinity. Why did you let him... I didn't. He, he took me unawares. Now, ah, now, when a woman is kissed, it's because she wishes to be kissed. That's nothing but masculine conceit. Well, now what happens? Miles Fairley is staying at the inn in the village as well you know. He'll either remain there or go away. It doesn't matter to me one way or the other. I think it matters more than you'll admit. Well, then why bother to ask me? You seem to know my mind better than I do. Ah, he puts brilliantine on his hair. Most men do. You can find an excuse for everything. Only because you're attacking him. I know, I know. It's a natural human reaction. Oh, I wish you wouldn't be so superior just because you're not alive. And he is. Yes, very much so. It's no crime to be alive. No. No, my dear. No. Only sometimes it's a, a great inconvenience. The living can be hurt. I don't intend to be hurt. But if I'm to go about in the world as you said, it... Well, it will mean taking risks. And real happiness is worth almost any risk. Well, watch your soundings, Lucia. I will, Daniel. I only wish you... You're all you'd... alone in the garden, ma'am? Oh, have some tea, Martha. Well, that's hard now. I swear I heard you talking. Is Uncle Nettie still about? No, he's gone. Mum, it's none of my business. But what's he up to? I rather think he's going to ask me to marry him. And you'd be willing to. I might. Why shouldn't I? Because he ain't good enough for you, that's why not. He's the kind of man no decent woman would associate with. Martha! I've got a right to my feelings, Mum, and I've got a feeling about him. Oh, I'm sorry. It's, it's just that I've been so worried about you lately, Mum. Don't worry, Martha. I know he isn't perfect, but, but he's real. Real? I thought I was impervious to emotion, but I'm not. I need companionship and laughter and, and all the things a woman needs. Well, I hope he can give them to you. I, I'll go fetch Anna, Mum. Excuse me. Well, Daniel, haven't you anything to say? Oh. <coughs> the sea in the moonlight, Lucy, and a warm summer night. I could stay here forever, my darling. I've never felt like this before, Miles. Hmm. How do you feel? I don't know. Like looking down from high up, all dizzy and, and unsure. You won't fall. I'll hold you. It isn't right. It can't be to feel like this. It is right, because you're happy. I should go back to the house. It's, it's Anna's bedtime. Oh, just this one night. Can't you pretend you've forgotten? Miles, what's wrong, darling? I'm jealous of a little girl. She's my daughter. I can't forget her. When you're with me, I want you to forget everyone else in the whole world. You're a magician. You make it seem all wrong to consider my duty. And only right that I... that I put my arms around you to be kissed. To be loved. Lucia, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. mm, asleep, huh? I thought you were one woman with sense. But you're like all the rest of them. Lucia, wake up. I'm talking to you. Blast it all, I said it. But... Uh, no, sleep on, Lucia. Sleep. I should have known. You've made your choice, the only choice you could make. You've chosen life, and that is as it should be. Whatever the reckoning. That's why I must go away. I can't help you now. Lucia, listen to me. Listen, my dear. You've been dreaming. Even now, you are dreaming. Dreaming of a sea captain that haunted this house. Of talks you've had with him. Even a book you both wrote together. But you, you wrote the book, Lucia. You and no one else. A 
book you imagine from this house and from that portrait on the wall. Now it's been a dream. And in the years to come, you'll remember it only as a dream. And it will die as all dreams die at waking. Ah, uh, ah, uh, but how you would have loved the North Cape and the fjords in the midnight sun, where the blue water rushes into green, the Falklands, where a southerly gale whips the whole sea white as snow. Ah, uh, what we both have missed, Lucia. What we both have missed. Goodbye, Lucia. Goodbye, my darling. We pause now for station identification. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Before we bring you Act Three of The Ghost and Mrs. Muir, I want to introduce a delightful young lady whom 20th Century Fox has recently added to his roster of young talent, Miss Jane Nye. In fact, Jane is so photogenic that a portrait of her won her a screen test. Have you met any of the top-ranking stars yet, Jane? Yes, Joan Crawford. I met her the first day she started work on Daisy Canyon. Oh, that's a picture Joan was keen to play in from the moment she read the book. And she was wonderful in the love scenes with Dana Andrews. Yeah, Joan knows how to get dramatic value out of a scene, too. Like the later scenes in Daisy Kenyon, when she's married to Henry Fonda. And she always looks so lovely. I was on the set one day when her stand-in was posing in some lovely lingerie similar to Joan's costume. Yeah, <laughs> less delicate versions, I'm sure. <laughs> yes, but even these were lovely. I could hardly believe it when the stand-in told me they had already been luxed a number of times and that Joan's even lovelier things get luxed, too. But John Kennedy ought to be interested in that. I am, Jane, but it's not surprising. Leading Hollywood studios specify gentle lux care for everything washable because it's so safe. Well, I've been a lux fan for years myself. As a matter of fact, Jane, luxed under things stay lovely three times as long. A scientific laboratory took a number of identical slips and nighties and washed them two ways. One set with a strong soap, the others the Lux way. It wasn't long before those washed with strong soap looked faded and drab, but the luxed ones stayed lovely three times as long. Well, that's a big help to any girl's budget. Right. And that means you can have three times as many pretty undies without spending any more. Because instead of just replacing worn-out faded ones, you can buy extra undies and have three times as many. Thank you, Jane Nye, for being here tonight. Back now to our producer, William Keeley. Act three of The Ghost and Mrs. Muir, with Charles Boyer as Captain Gregg and Madeline Carroll as Lucy. The coming of Miles Fairley into the life of Lucy Muir has marked the passing of the ghost of Captain Gregg. But Lucy scarcely noticed his disappearance in her love for her handsome suitor and the excitement over the success of a book called Blood and Swash. Imagine it, Martha, a check for 200 pounds from Mr. Sproul. Another 200 pounds for that awful book? La me, Mum, such language. And Mr. Sproul wants me to go to London immediately, some more papers to sign. Off to town you go, Mum. Don't you worry about Anne and me. But I can't possibly go to London. Mr. Fairley's coming. We're having a picnic. You mean he is... I heard you, Martha. Please remember that I'm going to marry him. Yes, ma'am. By the way, I, I've been thinking, we might put that portrait of Captain Gregg up in the attic. Don't you like it anymore? Oh, it was so silly of me to hang it here in my bedroom. I, I don't know what possessed me. Yes, ma'am. Oh, I most forgot. Here, boy brought this note for you from the village. Oh? From the bank, is it, ma'am? No, no, it's from Mr. Fairley. Oh, oh, how dreadful. He's been called up to London for a few days. But it's not dreadful at all. I'll go to London, too. I'll see Mr. Sproul as he wishes, and I'll see Miles. I'll surprise him, Martha. Quickly now, fetch Anna. I must say goodbye to her. Yes, ma'am? 
I'd like to see Mr. Fairley, please. I'm Mrs. Muir. Thank you, ma'am. If you'll wait in there, please. Who is that, Hilda? Uh, Mrs. Muir, ma'am. Oh? Perhaps I can help you, Mrs. Muir. Did I hear you say you wanted to see my husband? Husband? If you don't mind waiting, he'll be back soon. I see. Won't you sit down? No, I... I'd better go. I, I'm afraid I made a mistake. Mistake, Mrs. Muir? Yes, I'm very sorry. I think I understand, my dear. I'm sorry, too. Truly, I am. You see, it isn't the first time something like this has happened. <laughs> Now, Mum, you've all but cried your eyes out. You're home now where you belong. Oh, Father, what a fool. What a fool. Oh, there, there. He ain't worth it. Blast his eyes, he ain't worth it. Martha, do you know what day this is? Mmm, wash day. Yes, but it was exactly a year ago that we came here. Do you remember that afternoon? I went upstairs and I lay down before tea. You're hidden for a cup of tea, Mum. No, Martha. I'm thinking of the dream I had that afternoon a year ago. Such a strange dream. Oh, well. Anna will be coming home from school soon, Mum. Will you be taking her for a walk along the beach? Of course. I wouldn't miss it for the world. My little girl, Martha. She's all my life now. Mm, and most of mine, too. <laughs> soon there'll be no more walks. All too soon. She's growing up. School, then a university, young men, marriage. Oh, Martha, it will be on us before we know it. Before we know it. Dear Mother, it's so strange here at the university, so utterly different than Whitecliff, but I love it, darling. If only I didn't miss you and Martha so much. I count the days to get to it's incredible, Martha. I just don't believe it. Anna, Anna will be 18 on Friday. Well, come on, we'll walk to the village. We must get her package off to her today. And I'll be home on Saturday, Mother. And don't worry, I haven't been thrown out of the university. Just a wonderful opportunity to motor down to see you. And maybe, darling, maybe to surprise you, too. You see, there's a young man on that. Anna, darling. Oh, I'm so glad to see you. Did you get my letter, Mother? <laughs> yes, dear, but I don't understand. I wish you'd be more specific in your letters. Come I on in, Bill. Well, am I being specific now? Don't be shy, Bill. Here she is, my mother. How do you do? How do you do? His real name is Sir Evelyn Anthony Scathe, and we're thinking of getting engaged. Anna! Believe me, Mrs. Muir, I, I haven't even asked her yet. We've come for your blessing, Mother, and we haven't had tea. Anna, you... you quite take my breath away. Bill, darling, just make yourself at home in there. We'll sing out when we want you. We'll be in the kitch. Two more for tea, Martha. Anna, Anna. Oh, just look at them. She's home. She's really home. And you'll find a strange man in the living room. I gather his name is Sir Evelyn Skate, and Anna wants to marry him. I met him at a dance, Mother. He's a sub-lieutenant in the Navy. You know my weakness for sailor men. Oh, I've never been so happy in all my life. Then I'm happy too, darling. And I won't waste time now with questions. Now, I can't make tea with such distractions going on. Out in the garden now if you want to talk, both of you. <laughs> Mother, I've discussed it all with Bill. Of course, we won't get married till I'm out of the university. But you ought to come and live with us when we do, you and Martha. No, darling, no. Oh, but you must. You've been alone so much of your life. You're sweet, Anna. And I'm proud of you. But I love this house. I've been very happy here. And I shall live here until I die. With Captain Gregg? What did you say? With the ghost of Captain Gregg. Anna, what are you talking about? Oh, I knew the captain very well when I was a little girl. First year we lived here. We used to have the most wonderful talks. You didn't. Oh, it was all a game I'd made up, of course. Sort of a, a dream game. It was very real while it lasted. And then he stopped coming suddenly. I suppose I was growing too old and sophisticated for him. Oh, but I grieved and grieved. I even... Mother, darling, you look as if you'd seen a... Don't tell me you see him too. No, Anna. No, not for years. Well, then you did. 
Mother, you don't suppose he really haunted us? No, darling. Things like that can't happen. It was only a dream. The same dream for both of us? Perhaps I set you off by telling you about my dreams. Little girls are very impressionable. Oh, I don't remember your telling me. Oh, tell me now. I'd love to hear about them. But I can't remember them very well. Just bits and pieces, a, a phrase here and there, a look. I think I dreamed most of that book I wrote. I must have. I never could have thought of it. All these years I've tried to remember, but, but I can't. Do you know what I think? I think you fell in love with him, too. I did nothing of the sort. Oh, I wouldn't blame you if you had. When did you stop seeing him? After about a year. I dreamed we quarreled. It was about a man. Uncle Neddy. Anna, you knew that Miles Fairley and oh, I were... Oh, I used to pray you wouldn't marry him. And you were so right. I saw him five years ago at a dinner party, bald and fat and drinking too much. And he cried. It seems his wife finally had enough and left him. And to think I wanted to spend the rest of my life with him. Perhaps he did exist, Mother, Captain Gregg. Perhaps he did come back and talk to us. Wouldn't it be wonderful if he had? Then you'd have something, you know what I mean, to look back on. Happiness. No, darling. We just made him up, you and I. He never existed. I just wasn't intended to have that kind of happiness. And I haven't missed it, really, I haven't. Oh, I've been lonely at times, but there have been compensations. You, and now Bill, and dear Martha, and this house, the sea, and the girls, and memories. I've had those, you know, even if it was a dream. Now come along. We'll join your young man for tea. If she thinks it was a dream, I cannot blame her. It was all my own doing. I told her it was a dream. Ah, uh, how long ago this occurred. Even Anna is older now than Lucia was when she first stepped into this house. Anna. Long since married, children of her own, grown children. And Lucia, white and withered and full of years. Ah, oh, blast it all. When I decided to be noble, I never thought she'd live to be 80. Lucia! Lucia! You come in here, Mum. What are you doing out on that balcony? Don't you know what the night air does to you? I'm coming, Martha. I'm coming. What were you doing out there? I don't know. What difference does it make? Mm, I hope you remember what the doctor told you. That I'm an old woman. Well, so is he. There was a letter this afternoon from Anna. Little Lucy's engaged. <laughs> Little Lucy? To the captain of a transatlantic airplane. Anna's very happy about it. Says it must run in the family. Airplanes? I suppose she means captains. Here, you drink your hot milk. I'm too tired. I... And I have a funny pain in my arm. No wonder standing out there in that fog. Sit down now and drink it while it's hot. I don't want any hot milk. Now, now, don't get into a state. I am not in a state. I... I just want to be left alone, bossing me around all the time. Well, I'll leave it on the table. Take it or not, I don't care. Bossing me. I'm tired. Milk. All right, I'll drink it. I... Oh. Martha. Martha. I feel so... Oh. Lucia! At last! You'll never be tired again, Lucia. Or old again. Look at you. Radiant. Like the day you came here. Come, Lucia. Come, my dear.
Our stars will return for their curtain calls in a moment. Say, Libby, I, uh, I have a riddle for you. I'm listening. When are a cook's hands like a rose garden? <laughs> I can see you're dying to tell me. When they're in flower. <laughs> <laughs> but when a housewife's hands are the color of a red, red rose, she doesn't like it a bit. It means she has a bad case of dishpan hands. But she can do something about that. Just change from strong soaps to Lux Flakes for dishwashing. Changing to Lux takes away that red look. Makes hands soft and smooth again. Smooth as white rose petals, the way her hands used to be. And the way husbands still prefer them. Lux Flakes almost make dishwashing a pleasure. The suds feel so soothing and rich. And they certainly get the dishes clean fast. Lux is a real time saver. It rinses so perfectly you don't need to dry the dishes. Just rinse them with hot water and let them drain. They dry without streaking. And don't forget, Lux is as easy on the pocketbook as it is on hands. Tests show Lux suds are so much richer, you can wash up to twice as many dishes with Lux as you can with the same weight of ten other leading dishwashing soaps. Lux is thrifty. Back now Here's Mr. Keeley at the microphone. Who brought the ghost and Mrs. Muir so vividly and happily to life, Charles Boyer and Madeline Carroll. Madeline, you don't know how happy we are to welcome you on this stage again and how proud we are of your war record overseas. Well, Bill, you can't imagine how happy I am to be back and to be teamed for the first time on Lux with Charles Boyer. The feeling is mutual, <laughs> believe me, Madeleine. But I understand that in addition to all your other work overseas, you had your own uh, radio show in Paris. That's right, Charles, for about a year after the E-Day. We broadcast once a week in French, to tell the French about America and Americans. Well, everything I've heard from France these past few years has been about the wonderful job you did for French-American relations. And you haven't done such a bad job either, Charles. Right, Bill. Almost everything I heard in Paris concerning Hollywood was about Charles Boyer's French Research Foundation and what it was doing to create a better understanding and appreciation of France. Well, well thank you, Madeleine. But coming back to this theater, Bill, I'm sure your audience is keen to hear about the show for next week. And I'm sure they'll be keen about the show itself. It's Universal International's quite recent screen hit, Ride the Pink Horse, with its three fine stars, Robert Montgomery, Wanda Hendricks, and Thomas Gomez. That's the picture that Bob himself directed, isn't it, Bill? Yes, and it's a truly thrilling screenplay drama, a story of mystery and adventure that should keep our audience guessing breathlessly what's coming next, and usually, I'll wager, guessing wrong. Sounds like a real hit, Bill. We'll be listening in my house. Bonsoir. Good night. Bonsoir et merci bien. <laughs> Lever Brothers Company, the makers of Lux Flakes, join me in inviting you to be with us again next Monday evening when the Lux Radio Theater presents Robert Montgomery, Wanda Hendricks, and Thomas Gomez in Ride the Pink Horse. This is William Keeley saying good night to you from Hollywood. Charles Boyer will soon be seen in the Enterprise production, Arch of Triumph. Our music was directed by Louis Silvers. And this is your announcer, John Milton Kennedy, reminding you to join us again next Monday night to hear Ride the Pink Horse with Robert Montgomery, Wanda Hendricks, and Thomas Gomez. Epsident won by three to one. Yes, by an overwhelming average of three to one, families throughout America who compared toothpastes they were using at home preferred new Pepsodent with Irium over any other brand they tried. They said new Pepsodent toothpaste tastes better, makes breath cleaner, makes teeth brighter. Yes, with families who made comparison tests, Pepsodent won by three to one. Be sure to listen next Monday night to the Lux Radio Theater presentation of Ride the Pink Horse with Robert Montgomery, Wanda Hendricks, and Thomas Gomez. Stay tuned for My Friend Irma, which follows immediately over most of these stations. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. <laughs>